I want to like this movie more, and I didn't. Would it ever appear on like my best of all time? Probably not. There are secrets beyond imagination. There are memories time cannot erase. Welcome back to Cal and Dave versus The Machine. We got to watch Sophie's Choice this week. Overall, I really did like this movie. Meryl Streep and Kevin Klein both give these very affecting performances. I think there's a lot to like delve into there as far as like how do you deal with trauma? How do you survive something that is seriously unmanageable for most people? On the same token, I think you can very much tell that this is a book adaptation. And as such, there's some conventions and some plot points that I don't feel really work all that well. The kind of comparison I give is One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest. In that book, it's told from the chief character. But in the movie version, I don't think you really could tell it. In this, you can very much tell that it's the third person. Young man called Stingo. Who is telling the story. It's who the narration is read by. They're kind of centered as the main character. And I don't care a single lick about him. I just want to keep focusing on Kevin Klein and Meryl Streep. And then anytime it comes back to that third character, I'm like, why are you wasting my time? Anytime you have a film told from a character's perspective and the character's name isn't a human name. Stingo. You're already starting off. You get problem. really upset by this character's Stingo. name. It's not a name. What the fuck does Stingo, Stingo. mean? What, what is that? Where did that come from? Why is that even Pokemon, in this? Pokemon, actually. It's probably not Peter McNichol's fault as an actor, but the character itself is awful. You can't connect with it because it floats in this awful narrating. Allegedly, he's involved in some type of sordid three-way something and it just doesn't work. It's very great Gatsby, Dave. Well, except not good. Right. <laughs> and when they break away from that problematic narrative tool and we see Meryl Streep and Kevin Klein really work in it, those scenes are great. The concept behind it, unraveling this mystery of what Sophie's choice actually was, fantastic. There are moments where I almost said Scott Bakula. <laughs> well, he did actually have to quantum leap into this storyline, bring in the quantum leap universe. Everything has to have a multiverse nowadays, Dave. We've talked about Bakula before. Which with Clute. And I think it's kind of the same thing. Beautiful camera work. And we have this incredible female lead and we have moving uh, narrative devices that are then held back, anchored by some dead weight. Some of the shots with Kevin Klein. there's this great scene where he's conducting himself. We talked about that Kubrick-esque thing where they're in the carnival and some of the lighting tricks. Beautiful. But somehow I found the whole movie itself kind of underwhelming. I want to like this movie more and I didn't. It's not a bad movie. It's, it's fine. There's a reason why it's memorable. There's a reason yeah. why Meryl won her second Oscar. It was fine. I think right? solid. It was, I don't think it's a bad movie. Okay. I think there's some very compelling stuff in it. But would it ever appear on like my best of all time? Probably not. There's some elements that just hold it back a bit too much here for me. It almost feels dumb to say it nowadays, but it's like, hey, Meryl Streep was actually really good in this movie, but she is. It is one of those great performances. She learned to speak Polish, Polish English, and German with a Polish accent just for this film. That's next level, yeah. next level shit. This was nominated for best best original yeah, score. I actually do really like the score in this. I mean, E.T. is E.T., so of course I would award it to E.T., but it's a pretty decent score. Next week, we're going to... Have to make a choice between adopting or not, because we're going to talk about Little Orphan Annie. It's a hard knock life. What happened this week in 1982, Dave? We kind of alluded to it last week. April 17th, we have the Canadian Charter of Rights and Freedoms. That's right. We had the flag already because that came in 1965. <laughs> yeah, we weren't our own country yet, technically. If you are not Canadian watching us, uh, we're technically part of the British Dominion. Pierre Trudeau was like, fuck it, let's get out. Let's be our own people. And the Queen's like, yeah, you know what? Word. And then everybody's like, yeah, we're so happy. And now we're here. Great history lesson. Can you basically. imagine that that queen is still the queen today? She's been around Survived a long coronavirus time. and she's like, I'm not giving this crown to nobody. Charles, that guy, not a chance. <laughs> you have to rip this scepter out of my cold, dead hands. When and if Charles ever becomes king, of course, his face would be put onto our money. Uh, but he has to face the opposite way. Oh, alternates because he's between the secession. Monarchs. Ah. She looks to the right, if I'm not mistaken. He'll be looking to the left. Who cares? Doesn't matter. If he decides not to take the throne. Well, that if Charles means, doesn't uh, take it, the other guy, his son. And he would face the one direction. Harry Styles would make a good king. I'm just saying. How do we king Ralph it so that Harry Styles <laughs> becomes king? How many people would we have well, to kill? That's the basis of a movie. That's our movie, Dave, <laughs> that we're trying to write. If people mysteriously start to die in England, it's not us. <laughs> Look at this God's gift. 